Greetings, this is Dr. Tavo DRC. We're going to be talking about a lot of things on this website, a lot of things on these broadcasts, and a lot of things in these ministries. And one of them is about discernment. And the big word is discernment. In this case, what is contention? And what is contending for the faith? Let me quote Jude 1, 3. It says, Beloved, being very eager to write you of our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now the key words are found in this, that the Bible teaches in Proverbs that contention all contention is rooted in the spirit of pride. So when you hear the voice of a speaker and they're contending, one must discern and perceive correctly the attitude behind any type of comment. And I would refer everyone over to the book of James for this because we want to make sure that we say things maybe that are sober. Sometimes they're too sober for some. S solemn. But also we can be pretty hilarious and joy-filled so that our joy may be full. But the point is that we want to make sure that we point out the difference. You know, there's sort of shades of gray, of discernment, of clarity. People are not getting it, that there is a difference and a time to stand up, to speak up, to have a voice that is really contending for the face against mass hysteria, mass denominational, you know, doctrine that is now popular and widespread for maybe the last 25, 30 years. Such an example would be the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which I recall being a believer for all my life, you know, in God's mercy, many decades. Seeing the doctrines of the Nicolaitans really start to surface in my life as a junior minister back in the 80s and 90s when the Jimmy Swagger, Jim Baker thing happened. And I'm not sure that's when Celebrity Circus started in the charismatic movement, but I do remember that there were things even before that in the setting up of leaders above the laity so that the pastor is now the up on a pedestal or the head founder of a national movement is almost worshipped as the deity instead of as a human who happened to have an organic re relationship with the Lord, the Holy Spirit who gave him original organic apostolic doctrine. So when we look back, we can look back at our, our own lives and say, now what are we really believing that's hype? What are we believing that we heard in some tent meeting? What did that, you know, we, from some famous person, and what is actually in the scripture if Jesus were to come back himself in the organic day? You know, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was written about in the books to the lampstands in the book of Revelation, and it's, uh, were part of the controlling spirits of religion. They were where they first separated the leadership from the laity. If you go to Ephesians 2, Ephesians uh, 4, where, where Paul and the apostles are uh, part of the organic five-fold ministry, you could see that none of them were celebrities. None of them were uh, elevated or elitist because they didn't use capital letters when they said apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. It only happened now in the, you know, in the latter centuries because of just the need for fame, power, position, and glory that would outshine even the Lord's Holy Spirit glory. So we're going to talk about things, we're going to discuss things and not mince words, but I want you to notice the difference between being a contentious spirit, which is a religious, proud, combative, dogmatic ego, huge ego, versus one that is really just upset in a Jesus turning over the temple money changers, Holy Spirit, you know, called point of view that may not you know, be fitting or rank, it may rankle people, frankly, but, you know, every prophet, every person who walked in the office of the prophet was not a popular person and neither should any pastor, any parent be, any natural parent or spiritual parent call out to be popular with people, only want to be popular with the Lord. And so we love everybody. We truly do. We forgive everybody. We haven't got any list of hate speech or condemnation. We're not trying to have any baggage and emotionalism. But you know what? You do get a little excited because you think, man, this is frightening for the young people, for the new generation, for the people who are 
lost, who are confused and dazed about who is the real Christ? Who should I really follow? All I see is what I see on TV, Christian TV, and, and in the media, and placards, and screaming, and all I see are people when I walk in the grassroots of certain parts of the, of the, of the nation and the charismatic leadership, all I see is a desert, a barren wasteland, a fundraising of pumping your own, hyping your own ministry, your own part of the kingdom or queendom instead of being real and getting a plastic phony impression of Jesus. I guess I sort of picture also a debit, you know, like a credit card Jesus. A credit card Jesus full of phony plastic, living off a of false interest and running up a big debt. A debt of the soul, a debt of the human mortal soul and so forth. But let's get over to discernment. I was getting, a, you know, I'm sure I was getting a little preachy, a little over much on that comment, but we'll say this. This. Let me go to our guideline for discernment of anyone's words, any human words, messages, cell phone voices, prophetic words, emails, and so forth, that this is James 3.17. And I want to look this up so that I can read it verbatim for the listener, and because it's such a good one for use in daily life to see who is true and who is false and let's just do it this way <clears throat> I'm going to use the King James Version and it says let's see where is that verse there it is but the wisdom here it is the wisdom that comes from above is first of all pure then peaceable gentle and easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make make peace now that's a mouthful and let's talk about the difference between contention the spirit of contention it says in the book of proverbs is born from the root of the spirit of pride that means you need to get your way your agenda across or else you'll throw a fit you'll get condemning you'll get you know, you have a personal secret agenda or a known agenda to get your way, and that's where pride is all about. It will fight, it'll be dogmatic, it'll thump its Bible on somebody's head or, you know, whatever, get self-pity, work things as a manipulating factor. And so I want you to know when you hear our website and our ministry that you may not agree with everything. You may think, well, you know, who's saying it is some, you know, female, some woman saying it. But you know what? I want you to know this, that when you check out what the words are, not the human earth suit, the look of the white skin or the earth suit female, all right, then you need to go by and judge and say, well, you know, when she says something or teaches it or when I write something, a book or anything, judge it by and discern it by the clarity of James 3.17. But the wisdom that is from first, first above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. That means it won't get in a fist fight and argue to prove its point, to get its way. It won't withhold affection. It won't withhold love or have manipulation, hype you know, false use of energy and false use of authority, of spiritual authority, natural authority, emotional authority to get what it's want and be willful. Instead, it's easily entreated. It works things out. It'll confront if there's a problem. It won't hide from confrontation. It'll be full of the Holy Spirit, full of mercy, it says, and good fruits. Now, Galatians 3, fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, temperance, meekness, you know, and those type of things. Later it says that the wisdom that comes from above is without partiality. It doesn't play favorites. It doesn't have one person as a set up on a, a hero's big I, little you in the body of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. It may have heroes. It may have people who you discern to be good role models. But Jesus was the only perfect, pure-hearted person all the time, and we're certainly not. But we can at least admire him, and we can admire good leadership and good authority role models. And I've seen a lot. I would love to brag on names after names of national strength apostolic chief ministers, but then there would be this other thing that people would come up with according to your own background and view of things. You'd think, oh, she's a favorite. She's picking favorite. She's partial to 
this kind of person or that kind of person or that kind of color person or that kind of charismatic or Baptist person or Pentecostal person. And you know what? We can have private preferences. Everyone should and can. But we will never exalt one and put more favor on them to say, you know what, they are better than me or they are worse than me because of whatever flavor they choose to be and they're called of God to be. So it takes discernment, it takes being honest, completely honest, not hiding from honesty, being candid, and being without hypocrisy. And so you may say, well, she surely is a too strong lady. She is too strong. I don't want to hear her. She's a woman. I don't want to hear what she's got to say. But you know what? If you don't, that's fine. Thank you for trying. But you know what? I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not going to mince words and be a hypocrite, a plastic phony and if you love me that's good if you hate me that's fine but I'll see in heaven if we are both believers and true believers and if not that's your choice you know so the fruit of righteousness that means not being holier than thou not being superior not being coming across as aloof mysterious in a bad way not feeling condemnation or preachiness in a uh, way that is that no one can tell you anything new and see that's the difference you can have an opinion you should have an opinion Jesus said faithful I mean in the Bible of Proverbs it says faithful are the wounds of a friend so there may be times when you're unpopular you get a word from the Lord or a piece of advice or wisdom and people are hurt by it and they don't think you're mean because they don't know their scriptures and they don't know who God really is God's love covers a multitude of sins. That means even ignorant behavior, errors, lack of, you know, love, omission, uh, wrong kind of submission, and so forth. And then judging and criticizing, it covers a lot of things. But you won't find me unentreatable over here if you took your time to make your busy appointment calendar get your secretary up to call my office manager and then you can arrange an appointment where we sit down together and fellowship and you can see me and say you know what I got that email and it really was bad or I saw that web article I saw I heard what you said and I'm just angry about this because you're too you're you're just messing with my bunch over here and and we're all crazy Maddox and you don't you know you said things that stir me up and make me a mad as a hornet well you know what that's fine go ahead and be mad as a hornet but I'm not mad at you personally I'm just mad at the fruit the spiritual fruit and what I've said is there is a difference between common ordinary spiritual fruit and fallout which is baggage bad damaging baggage that is turning people off to the Holy Spirit that has turned people off to Jesus Christ because they don't know who he is and they can't find a normal real believer a real chosen person all right I'm sorry if I hurt people I have hurt people because I'm human but you know what I've never been a hypocrite and never been one that says if you want to you know reprove me do it in a polite biblical manner which is face to face which is respectful tone which is not cursing me out or condemning me but you know what I have a lot of board members and friends I have good friends that are tough and they will love me enough to shoot me straight but never kill me and I'm the same way I love you that much that I would never hurt you I would never abuse you I'd never hide my shun you to get my way and manipulate you to get my will exerted over yours because that's not in the book and read James 3.17 this is why we're t telling things because a lot of people ex around town they think anyone who shows any kind of anger be it moral outrage which is what I would call right now this moral upset offense at the spirit of religion not at humans there's a difference between moral outrage and passion for Jesus like Jesus when he was just so upset at the religious system of his day the Pharisees the religious in crowd that he went inside at the unction of the Holy Spirit and he even went to this 
the vestibule where all the book tables were set up and the t-shirts were about to be sold and he went in there and ran roughshod and turned them over. What would happen? Their MasterCard and Visa system would fly and unplug. You know, get the drift there. But then he didn't have any orchestrated placards of his disciples outside screaming at the high priest. He never name called them. He never pulled a switchblade. He didn't have hate speech. He would, didn't even probably let his disciples know. They would have clouded the, the discernment of his view. He was on a mission of high drama, and Jesus was anointed, equipped as a prophet to use high drama that would shake them up out of their dense, lulled into complacency, all-knowing mindsets, do-gooder mindsets, people-pleasing mindsets, money-making, king, personal kingdom-building mindsets. And, you know, all of us are human, equal opportunity sinners, chief sinners. And so, therefore, the grace of God could all of us go. So we have to say, Father, forgive us. All, me included, we know not what we've done, when we've acted lovingly, how we've acted lovingly, and how we've not fit in when you wanted us to be more submissive and how you've wanted us not to be so quiet and we refused to stand up and choose the way that was unpopular with other people. So there's a bunch of things in the mixture. And then here we are right now. We're dealing with the our uh, gay community friend. And I would say this, let's just stir it up and get the mix going even more. If I go with Christians, I'm just looking right now, I can say the word, I met a homosexual, and he is, you know, a, he's a nice person. I could say, now what are they going to say if they call themselves a Christian? And you know what, my friends, they're organic kind, they'll shoot straight, and they'll tell me the real truth. So I first of all ask their opinion, just to see what would happen. And each one, the real organic, relatable true believers for I mean in their 70s and 60s even they all to a person said oh because he you know, he'd been hurt and I said he'd been hurt all this stuff and they said oh really and they showed love they showed trusting loving compassion all right others you say that word h word homosexual and you will find people quoting the scripture right in your face right at the book you know, it's a sin. It's, and you know what? No wonder people don't like to come to your church. No wonder they don't like a born-again Christian because they all they see is that. You can't even see past their, their choice of sin or whatever you want to call it. My choice of sin. I don't even know all the ones I wear. So we all have to say we're all got to be seen as equal opportunity chief sinners in the eyes of God and man except for the grace of God and his good old mercy. I forgive everybody. Everybody doesn't always forgive me back. Sorry to say, but that's their deal. And that's why I'm speaking so plain because a lot of people are not wanting to know discernment issues, big issues that are real and clouding the body of Christ in the minds of the Christian community and their leaders and staff even today as I speak. Jesus, it said, went about doing good. He went about accepting the people but not their sin. If I accept a person, if I accept you, if you're living in sin, if you've got homosexuality, if you've got lying, if you've got fornication, if you've got drunkenness, if you've been cheating on your taxes, if you've been doing things, I accept you for the person inside that's deep down in there, the human toiling soul, all right? The same with myself. I don't go by your, you know, many times I can be put off by your pride, your arrogance, your haughtiness, staring down. I will be put off. You know, most people would. But I can go past uh, by faith that you are called of the Lord, that you've got the call to know the Holy Spirit, to walk the true love walk, to be normal, to be relatable, to be a friend of God and a friend of our family of God. And see, this is where you're walking about, stumbling about the body of Christ these days, and you keep running into like a pinball machine, a cast of characters, like the ball in the pinball machine. You're shot out by the Lord. You go out doing good, doing God's business on your on your ministry, going about doing the daily business, you know, for your life, and you run into 
different kinds, all these different kinds of believers and quasi-believers and those who name themselves charismatic movement believers or Baptists or Pentecostal or black believers or white believers, you know, all the different kinds, green believers. And there are a few that one can know that they are genuine, they're loving, and they're green. I call it green. That means they're it, green in the Lord is you don't get into the color racism thing. There's no prejudice. There's no anti-woman vibe. There's no anti-man vibe. There's no anti-anybody vibe. There's a maybe a caution because they ought, need to discern and be wise, but they also are perceptive enough to say, you know what, I'm focusing on the organic you. Maybe the organic you used to know the Lord and he's fallen away. But now I see the hope of glory that God wants to restore you and show you his love and teach you more about himself. Or they may say, you know what, you are just a leader. You're called of God. You've already got the calling going. You're living the high life. You're living for the high price that it takes to live for the glory of God. Oh, we're so grateful to know you. We're so proud of you. God is proud of you. And that's a small, very small, sadly small subgroup of ministry out there. And hopefully I fit, you know, we can all fit in there, you and I. But we say that's a daily thing. God, give us more grace to live this, you know, to, just to be normal and real and a true representative of you, of you, Father and Holy Spirit, every day. And it's by His grace. We have to humble ourselves. All right, next we have a group that's called, I call them God's Tough Customers. Tough customers, sometimes they're gods, used to know God, or say, presume that they think they know God, or tell everybody and preach that they know God, but really, or they're ones that don't know God or against God, and they don't give a rip about anything we're talking about. And you know what? That's okay because it's their deal. I'm not their mama, and it ain't going to be. And, you know, we have to love them where they are. And pastors, some of you senior pastors, are just as nice as can be and plain and open and, you know, serious and caring. And then others are like plastic and phony and major into self and so tired and over busy that they're no earthly good. They have no human compassion. They're all human compassion fatigued. And that seems to be what I've run into the, a lot against out here in the deep south. And so we don't, you know, we can remember. So it leaves an emotional imprint. It really does. It leaves a human emotional imprint where you have to work sometimes. It's like dirt that gets in your, your soul, the immortal soul. And you have to really work with God's help to repent from any bitterness and unforgiveness. But then you have to, you know, that helps you with your discernment. You can, once you've been bitten by a few snakes, you learn to, rep <coughs> you need to spy the snake in the spirit and you can, so that you're not bitten again. And so it's such a is manipulation. I'll be honest, human manipulation and fraud are the hardest ones for this person to take, not being real, not being upfront, not representing Christ, at least by being righteously angry at me or and not screaming at me and beating me down or using the F word, which I have had done, and we forgive them, but it's not a pleasant thing, and we would not do that to anybody. So we realize that the roughshod group Many clusters out there are not well parented either naturally or spiritually. We hope that spiritual parents will get a little teaching and edification out of this so that they can learn the difference now between real love, gushy, gooey, accepting love, which is part of life, but then what is God's upfront tough love? that takes a licking but keeps on ticking and has to always deal with all these tough customers who present themselves as all-knowing, all-wise in the born-again people groups. And you know what? You leaders understand this. There are many people, and we have a book coming out called And We Need Prayer to get all these books out. There are tons. We're waiting for prayer, I guess, and help. 2 Timothy 2, 24, 25, and it is a word for all of us in this day. It says, minister with meekness to those who oppose themselves, who are held captive by their own will under the power of the devil. 
And so it takes meekness to get through to the pride, the mental pride and superiority in the tough customers, God's tough customers, be they preachers, parents, or pastors or leaders or lay people or non-believers, you know. But the, the God's tough customers are people who oppose themselves. And that's one of our fields, our many fields of calling to minister to and speak and address and knowledge on expertise in the spiritual sense, I guess you could say. Do we condone people that are gay and living a gay lifestyle? I put it this way. I don't condone anyone that lives apart from what the scripture would say, but I would never, ever, ever, ever throw a rock of superior contention at anyone who lives any kind of sin lifestyle, no matter what. I would never do that with any person of any skin color. I would never do it with any person who call themselves, you know, a Christian and live the opposite because sin is sin is sin. And even to over talking and overeating is a sin that's widely accepted in the body of Christ by the quote quasi and real born again people groups. All right. We're just going after this. We don't want hypocrisy, Jesus' name slandered like it's being slandered popularly today by hypocrites. All right, now all of us, you know, I mean, I don't mean that as, oh, this hypocrite thing. I just meant in keeping with James 3, 17, the wisdom of any teacher, any pastor, any believer that is free to say about the Lord needs to be wise and say the wisdom that comes from God if you're truly speaking, God is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And then wait till you hear this. People are always thinking, you know what? They're, she's talking condemnation. She's talking condemnation and, and contention. And that's where we're going to minister on this right now. We need to. People are growing up. They're not willing to get it. All right, maybe they are now, but they're not really across when you meet the rank and file pastor, leader, or friend, you know, and, and not all fr you know, my friends are not like that. They're mature, but let's talk, discuss the fruit of righteousness in James 3.18 that is sown in peace of them that make peace. All right, now, if you're going to have, if you're putting out a riot, then you're going to have to make peace. If you're going to toss over the corrupt business religious system like Jesus went in there and did, he wasn't exactly looking like the typical, oh, he's a loving Christian. He's being sweet. He's the baby in the manger. He would never, ever hurt anybody. He would never ruin a service. Oh, no, it wouldn't be loving. And that's the syrupy, sick sweetness that's out there in superficial plastic kingdom-making. In my opinion, I submit that to you. Jesus saw the spiritual arrogance, the violence in the temple, his soul linked to the Father, yoked daily in the Garden of Gethsemane, was grieved. He was grieved and pent up with frustration and moral righteous indignation. You know, the Bible teaches, be angry. It's a command, be angry, but sin not. Jesus, like I said, never pulled a switchblade, didn't organize the Christians into a riot outside, never screamed at the priests, calling them bad names and accusing them as they walked into the temple, even though they knew they were practicing monetary greed and religiosity. But Jesus, in his pure heart, his wisdom pointed out the spiritual violence, the raping going on in the temple under the guise of godliness. And it was all he could stand. And I'm sure that he was led of his Holy Spirit, the Father, and he waited and he had to be patient while it happened over and over and over, maybe for years. He had to, his spirit perceived and discerned it, but he was not given the liberty to rise up. He was not given the liberty to say, I'm going to go and say something now, but I don't know what it would be and when to do it or how to do it unless I see what my Father is doing and how he's telling me to do this. 
So it turns out that the Bible teaches in the Gospels that one day when it was the God-appointed time under the anointing of the confrontational spirit, religious spirit of you know trying to control, uh, combat and confront the controlling personalities of the chief priests who were over the oversight of the moneymaker and the false religion of the temple. Jesus hears from the Holy Spirit in the Garden of Gethsemane, probably. He hears, today's the day. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And Jesus checks it out to make sure it's really his father. And then he, without conferring with his disciples, without getting their permission, without checking with the high priest to make sure he's not uh, that he's still under their spiritual authority, without asking Mama Mary's permission or checking, telling his brothers and sisters what he's about to do, what God is telling him to do, Jesus, under the Holy Spirit anointing for a godly, upfront, tough love and confrontation, to be a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper, a placating, a, you know, passive peacemaker, peacekeeper. He's a peace maker and he strides purposefully under the anointing into the temple and proceeds to turn over the business tables of the ministry literally now the comp comparison to this of a person solely acting under prophetic anointing like the apostle the original organic apostle and prophet true prophet of all times, of our faith, Jesus Christ, the, there are two more examples of people who are not so self-absorbed with their own being under to all these human authorities that they had to bow and scrape and earn their way brown-nosing up the corporate ladder of their ministry. We've seen that. That's why I can say this, you know. It goes on. Well, I think Elijah, if one would go to 1 Kings, Elijah. Elijah the prophet, one day was there. God spoke to him, I want you to go over there in the country of Israel where the reputation of the big Jezebel herself, the queen, and the weak wuss Ahab were ruling. He goes in there, doesn't take a prayer team, doesn't have anybody as his sidekick. He knows the Holy Spirit, he's a prophet. A true prophet. He goes in there. He does. He just there. Are Four hundred and fifty false prophets of a false religion meet him and challenge him. One person, all alone, except for the power and the spiritual authority of the Lord. They call down fire. Elijah pours water on the altar to say, "This my God can even lap up the water." And all the other false prophets, 450 against one, begin to pull their hair and cry out and scream for their God to move and nothing happens. Whereas Elijah speaks and calls out and commands the you know, move of the Holy Spirit and fire comes down and laps up the altar. And after this is done, you'd think this is enough you know, spiritual energy to use and you know a lot of physical and emotional strength to be that strong and to not be moved or fearful or chicken out. But instead, now the queen, Jezebel, the dominating devil personified herself of the queendom, uh, the well-known, uh, and her husband who was so weak that he couldn't rise up to say, you know what, I'm the head of this household and I'm supposed to be the king and you're my queen and submit. But you know what? He forsake his authority. He just let her do it. He he allowed her to do it by not by yielding to fear, the, and allowing himself to be controlled. Let's skip briefly over to the popular topic of Jezebel over in the book of Revelation, Church of Thyatira, chapter three, where we tell people where a lot of people blame females and they'll say. You know, it says, why do you tolerate that Jezebel, that female teacher? Why do you tolerate her? You know what? That was why God rebuked them. They said, you tolerate a controlling personality. It happened to be a lady. But you know what? Old Ahab back in 1 Kings, he tolerated her by not rising up. And Adam tolerated Eve eating because God told, if you look at, if you look at um, Genesis, Adam... He, 
forsake his own spiritual authority as the head of the garden and of life, you know, and the wife as well, because God had first in chapter 1, verse 34, spoken privately to Adam about not eating that fruit when he was the only human on earth, Eve had not been formed. So he had a personal one-to-one father-son heart-to-heart chat. But that wasn't enough. When Eve came, I don't know if he let his senses beguile him, his mercy. Oh, I don't want to hurt her feelings by telling her not to eat that fruit. Or maybe he's just too busy out in the sun enjoying counting the animals, being a rugged outdoorsman and said, you know what, I don't care what you do. Just leave me alone. I want to be my, do my own thing. And whatever it was, when Eve came with toward Adam with the fruit she had been tempted into be deceived into eating Adam had an opportunity right then to say Eve put that down you know what God said but instead Adam just said oh yeah honey looks good let me have a bite and he willfully chose to lose his strength to by choice by yielding to himself and forsaking God's authority for all time So we can get a lot of people upset with this, but, you know, check the scripture out, check me out, and say, is she easily entreated? You know, being forceful, you know, having to meet, being strong in the Lord can be mistaken as mean. And so that's why I'm teaching on this too. Contention is being proudful. You know, if you came up to me and spoke to me and said, I want to speak to you, I'd punch you out or I'd spit in your face or say you chew you out. I've never done that yet. It's up to somebody who's a demon. They'll stand back and bind it. But um, on the other hand, if I talk and get all excited and hepped up, as they say, it's because of frustration. Let's put it this way. Big time moral indignation at the name of the abuse that goes on under the name of Jesus Christ following. When you hear our website and you hear the testimony of a little child, a former little child who was abused... And that's by the only Christ followers he knew, his parents and a priest. You will want to hear this story because it's, and he didn't even tell but a a little bit. He cleaned it up so that the viewer, the listener could hear, you know, and he didn't have, want to tell everything. And I don't blame him, but it was that bad. And so we just submit that to you as your discernment. See, everything I say is Selah. Uh, Pick out the hay. You're free. Pick out the hay. Throw out the stubble, please, please. I'll do the same with you in any movement of God. I'll go by the Bible. But I have to teach on discernment practices. People are so confused about uh, if you feel energy from anybody, it's hate speech or energy from anybody, it's accusation or condemnation or pride, contention. When actually the Bible says that we are to contend for the faith. We can get grieved that God's message is being confused and polluted by mixture we need to get upset in a moral outrage non-pc politically correct way not mad at any sinner man i don't preach that i'm mad at me i get mad because i'm failing god i get mad to say well if this why have we got a the nerve in the christian community to point out america's going south because of any sin in our nation when we ourselves have not practiced self-judgment according to the scripture in the Old Testament where it says judgment begins at the house of God. So if judgment begins at the house of God, that's not accusation. That's not being mean. That's being scriptural. And that's not being condemnation or accusation. Let's say if let's say logic If judgment is supposed to begin at the house of God in America or at your house or your church or my house, then where in your house or your church house or in America should self-judging first begin? All right, this is a practical lesson. All right, then we say it should begin with the top. The Bible teaches the anointing flows from the head. So in that course, illogically, the head of household husband then wife, if single parent, if they're the head, the uh, pastor of the church, the leadership and staff, the elders of the church on down, the doorman at the gate of the temple, you know, all of us, then the congregation within the business leaders, and then the, you know, nobody can say, I am, I am not needing to examine myself. I am not needing to practice self-personal examination. 
and to see, is my, are my manners befitting the name of Jesus Christ? Am I treating people with respect, God's respect? Or do I have respecter of person's spirit, right? I only suck up to people that can make my movement grow. Or I can only be nice to people if they look good from the outside. Or if I see they have dark skin, I avoid them because they're not my kind or my style. And if I see somebody that I know is a practicing homosexual or a practicing this or that or, you know, whatever, witch, real witch, am I going to be afraid of them? Am I going to be demean them? Am I going to hur- hurl accusations and say mean things and judge them when I am not even yielding to being James 3.17 myself? And that is, any wisdom that comes first from above, if it's really from God, it's going to have this as its mark. Pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. To sow a fruit of righteousness in this nation, I don't care. I love the people outside the church, the four church walls, but God talks to the people within his house first. And I would say this, that to sow the fruit of righteousness in peace, that means you're not going to be hurling bad words or invectives that will criticize and condemn people. But there are times when when people are so blind and foolish that they don't, you have to not mince words because you're trying to make peace. You're trying to contend for the faith, not to be contentious. So if you would like to ever speak with Dr. Tavo or have her speak to your group and minister, or if you'd like to just chat with me or any associate, feel free to give us a call and I'll have Dan, the IFFM DFW Chief of Staff, get the appointment book out. And so we are looking for some more staff, but we don't want phonies. We want normal people who have a gift and a love of other people, a love of God first, a love of their family, they're safe, they're not the hypocrites, and they are ability to get along with people that don't look just like themselves with all kinds of people, with different mannerisms and different callings and to speak. You know, I have a young at heart, open to the, all the generations, all right? This is not about me. This is not about them. It's not about us. This is about God, and I want people to really get this. I want you to understand it. So I'm going to close now. But I hope this is helpful and enlightening. And like I said, I can be frustrated. I can become upset because of running into all these people who are quasi-ministers and tell me their ministry and then they'll take your stuff like I've had happen. They'll, you'll meet others that have been there like, you know, raped by them financially. And I met those people and meeting these. And then you meet the really organic sweet ones that are nice, that are keepers and pleasant. And there are a lot of those. But as a newcomer, you're finding your way around, and it's very few and far between to find people who are truly humble. They don't need something, you know, be paid for something to join their club, to pay their dues, you know, to get them something. It's really tough. I'll be honest. It's very hard to find people who don't expect you to give them something before they'll be nice to you. And I submit that to all of you. There are a few, though, and if you want to know where they are, and our church is going to be like that. But, I, you know, that's our goal. And then to also know the ones that are like that, we want to help you find them as well. So we're looking for good people, but also honorable people who are not dishonest and who have discernment and perception, who are perceivers of the beauty of the Lord and the goodness of the Lord, and then who walk in love, God's love, and are easily entreated especially. God bless you. This is Dr. Tavo D.R.C. coming to you from the Father's words from the prophetic cave, but the organic Christ-following community. God bless.